The scripture reading today is from John chapter 4, verses 7 to 26. It centers around a conversation between Jesus and a Samaritan woman while Jesus' disciples are in the city to buy food. A Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, asks a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? So for a little context, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one that you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. The salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the truth worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I feel like the choir has already said our prayer. <laughs> Speak, O oh God. Reveal to us as we come in reverence and in openness. Speak through the story of our faith, through the reflections of our thoughts, through the words of my mouth, and as the children said, through the actions of our lives. At the beginning of November, we began a series of, uh, of worship themes and reflections that we have called The Ridiculous Journey. And it's, it's based on the premise that the events and the choices of our lives form a, a journey, form a path that we would call, that's our life. <laughs> that's our path. The idea that, that life is a journey isn't a, isn't a new thing at all. In fact, in the last, I would say, 10 years, think about the books or movies or stuff that have come out that have talked about the journey, the way, eat, pray, love, wild, 
The Alchemist, A Walk in the Woods by Bill Bryson. Um, the, the idea that life is a path we walk goes, it, it, it feels like it's current, but it's also ancient. Abraham and Sarah head out not knowing where they're going, but feeling the call to the journey, not knowing the destination. Moses leading the people of Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness with a promise that that's going to lead somewhere and a dream of a promised land flowing with milk and honey, but not actually knowing clearly the destination. Circuitous for sure. And every pilgrim story uh, that has ever been written casts life as a journey, as a, as a path. And for us and for our life, uh, some of the path is, is kind of laid out by, by circumstance of birth, uh, by forces that are outside of our control. We don't just kind of make it up from scratch. Some of, it is us, some of it is laid on. But much of the path is choice and is created by the choices we make. Moment by moment, we make choices that both reveal and create who we are in the world and what our path will be. And those choices also give substance to what we believe to be its purpose and its meaning. The question we ask in the ridiculous journey is, well, we're going to choose a path, so why in heaven's name would we follow Jesus, a poor, homeless, wandering peasant from a back country in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. <laughs> it seems kind of odd and unlikely that, that you and that I would choose this character and would listen when he says, follow me. But somehow from early on in my life, and I don't know about yours, but this character's call has resonated. And it continues to resonate. Still stirs the heart. Still speaks to the soul longing for meaning and purpose. It's not an easy path, this one laid out by the gospel. It's not one that we know clearly the destination either. As much as Christian theology has tried to nail down that, definition, that destination with visions of angels and heaven and so on, we actually haven't been there and come back to tell. We don't even know what the destination is in this life. But the path reveals itself and is compelling. It's not an easy path. It asks a lot of us. But if we take it seriously, if we take it to heart, it will compel and propel our lives, even if at times it feels like a ridiculous journey. <laughs> So our study group on Tuesday evenings over the last six weeks has, uh, has looked at aspects of this journey, aspects of this gospel and this character who calls and seems kind of revolutionary and pushes us to our limits, turns the world upside down, last, first, and first, last, what do you mean by that? And, and, and then last week we heard the call here, uh, the day before Remembrance Day, to reconciliation to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it 
in this world. And, and then we hear of this woman who goes for coffee with people who sends her hate mail. She sounds like she's embraced the ridiculous journey. But as ridiculous as it seems, it still speaks to the depth of us. So this week, that ridiculous journey takes us into an encounter between Jesus and a Samaritan woman at a desert well outside of a Samaritan village. Jesus and his disciples are on the road, and they stop at the well outside a village. The disciples go into town to get some food, and Jesus is there by the well by himself. When a woman comes up from the village to draw water, it's around noon. She's by herself, and he asks her for a drink. And from that moment, the, the gospel writer launches into this long, somewhat convoluted story of an encounter with, with cryptic phrases and double meanings and I want to unpack it a little bit f for you and with you. So, Margaret read it beautifully, and I'm sure that it had a bunch of questions connected to it for you. Uh, so first of all, uh, this encounter between Jesus and this woman would be outrageous in his time. It doesn't seem kind of outrageous in our time as we're sitting here and just reading it out of a book. But in his time, it breaks all the rules. This is a, a woman of Samaria speaking to a Jewish man alone at a well. So first of all, in his time, a, a, a married woman would speak to her husband. And that's the only man in the public arena that she would ever speak to. If there is something that needs to be said to another man, it's her husband that speaks those words. It's a patriarchal society. You think there are occasionally societies still around today that function kind of this way. She's not to speak to Jesus. He's not to speak to her. Rule broken. Secondly, she's a Samaritan and he's a Jew. There had been some bad blood between those two groups and some difference of opinion that kind of uh, ruptured what had been like cousin relationships from a long time ago. And those parts of the family, based on, on a kind of religious beliefs and a whole lot of cultural stuff, had them go in separate directions. And, and so you had Samaritans living in the hill country and Judeans living in the valleys, and they just didn't have anything to do with each other, and all kinds of prejudice and, you know, those people in the hills, wow, well, you know those people in the valley. You, you know how that, that happens. It doesn't really happen today anymore, but... Um, <laughs> prejudice was strong. And that, that prejudice pops up throughout the Gospels. We see it. There's reference to Samaritans. Doesn't seem to stop Jesus. Rule number two, broken. Third, this particular woman seems to have a history. She's coming on her own to get water at noon by herself. Everyone else in the village would have come to that same well that day but probably first thing in the morning to gather water for the day. She didn't come at that time. She came at noon. Why would the gospel writer say that? <laughs> well, Jesus susses it out. Uh, go get your husband. I, I don't have a husband. Indeed, you tell the truth. You have had five husbands, and the man you are with right now is not your husband. This is a woman who has been... Well, in her society, the only safety net for her life is the man or, or, uh, and family that she's with. That's the only way women got security at the, in this patriarchal time. And so she has been passed from one man to the other. We don't know the circumstances of why. 
likely, I mean, she's an articulate woman. She is, she is on the ball. Likely, that is a, a constant search for security in her life. We don't know whether that search includes children, but it's a rough path. And it's a vulnerable path. It's not uh, for a rabbi to address someone who has that kind of history would have had stigma attached to it in a big way. Rule number three broken. Jesus is a rule breaker. This encounter breaks them all. And, and in the encounter, he perceives her soul is thirsty even before she speaks of it. And we don't get a direct window, but we get ample indirect window into what, how thirsty that soul may well be. He sees her at a level of deep respect that likely she has not experienced in any other part of life. He sees her. Nobody in her life and her community sees her. She's one of those invisible ones, one of those ones with, uh, away from whom you avert your eyes. No one thinks she deserves to be seen. And he speaks to her reality as an outcast and her deep thirst for human connection and human dignity. And he embodies it. So what happens in this encounter? Well, I think what, what is revealed in this count, encounter? I think Jesus reveals himself to be a sage, a wise one, a perceptive one, one who sees clearly what is underneath, sees through the distortions that inevitably build up around us and around life, but sees through those to the heart of things. That's the role of a sage, a wise one. Someone who is able to see clearly that all the distortions of prejudice, of racism, of sexism, of economy, of social, social marginalization, the many ways in which humanity gets distorted, all of that falls away. He sees the real person. He sees the soul. And in seeing, changes everything. I mean, it's, it's hard to see clearly in your life. I have been experimenting this week with contact lenses. <laughs> and the particular contact lenses I have been experimenting with are called monovision because I have progressive lenses, which means that my right eye has, if I was wearing the contacts, I'd be able to see the back row there nice and clearly. Yep. And I could see something written, and I would do that with my right eye, and I would see what I have in front of me from this distance really clearly with my left eye. But I've got them both open at the same time. There's been a, there's been a, a distortion or two this week, and you'll notice that I'm wearing my glasses. But seriously, it is hard to see clearly. We live in a cultural soup that has ingredients that distort. Sexism and racism distort the way we value and value people and distribute power. It gets distorted. I heard this week that, do you remember, do you remember that movie, Elizabeth, about the queen? The leading actor, the woman who played Elizabeth, got paid 75% of, of the salary that the actor of Philip got paid. 
That's a distortion rooted in sexism. It's also rooted in a whole economic system that distorts all kinds of things, which is another distortion that, that determines how we value people. There's lots of labor disputes happening right now, and it's, and it's growing. And in that economic system, humans are, have con, are, are considered to have market value. A market the market places a monetary value on a human's labor. These are humans. <laughs> Any way you cut that, there's going to be distortion. There are cultural norms around sexual orientation and gender that, dis that distort our definition of normal. And then we have history, cultural history, personal history. It is hard to see clearly living in that. I mean, I think most of my life I haven't seen clearly. I have had moments, I think, hopefully, but you never really know. The only, it's, I, I look back and in hindsight, I, s I can see more clearly the ways that I couldn't see well at the time <laughs> and, 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 the, and the way in which that affected the decision I make in my life. Moments of clarity, maybe, but there have always been distortions and blind spots. I mean, that's true of all of us. You can never get outside of your life far enough to see it clearly to see it with perspective. There's only so much of our path that we can see with perspective while we're on it. And you can't get off it. <laughs> A sage is someone who comes alongside with the ability to see clearly, to see us clearly, to see the path clearly, to see the world clearly, honestly, wisely, to see the effects of the distortions and see through them. Sometimes we call these people mentors, individuals that, look for, look, that we look to for wisdom and guidance. And sometimes it's just one person and sometimes it's, it's not one person, but it's a group of people. I think. I think I mentioned a while back um, that I think that everybody needs to have a board of directors for their life. You know what I mean? I have a board of directors for my life. I don't ever call them together, but I do call them up. People who, who y you believe know you deeply who, can't, who are grounded enough to look past all of my BS <laughs> and account for the distortions of my own ego in a way that I can't account for, who love me anyways and tell me what they really see and do it in such a way that I can actually stomach it because that can be hard. I wonder who would be on your the board of, on the board of directors for your life. Think about that for a bit. Jesus, uh, the sage, says, come and follow me. Walk in the way of the sage. Walk the path of honesty. Seek the path of wisdom, of clarity, and of depth. But to walk this path, we will have to practice. And we will have to learn, because it doesn't always come naturally. I gave uh, 
I gave the study group last week a task, and I hope, and I want to give it to you as well. And I hope this task, uh, it's a task that will help us to practice on a daily basis. Uh, practice habits that have us step onto the path of the sage, onto the path of, of wisdom, of depth, of honesty and clarity. And it is simply at the beginning of your day sometime to set your intention to do so. But to do it with a particular rem uh, easily remembered phrase. So this is the prayer. It comes from a very similar, familiar song. Uh, sometime near the beginning of your day, make a habit of praying day by day this day. Oh, dear God, three things I pray. To see you more clearly. To love you more dearly. And to follow you more, more nearly. Day by day. If, if we set our intention to be clear of sight, dear of heart, and close to the presence of God, well, I think we would be walking the path of the sage. Let's sing that.